Lori is going to help me. All right, let's all open our Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We are doing a verse-by-verse study through the book of Romans. This is the gospel according to the Apostle Paul. We have covered a lot of theology in the first 11 chapters about the gospel. And then uh, more of the practical side from chapters 12 to the end. Now we're in chapter 15, and in chapter 15, Paul is sharing his missionary heart for us, his heart for missions, and uh, specifically for pioneer missionary work, meaning that when I say pioneer, this is where Paul is taking the gospel to places that have not ever had a gospel witness in the past. It is a pioneer uh, effort, being the first missionary in that area. He has, as we saw last week, he has finished up the majority of the area where he uh, was working between Jerusalem and the Lyricum, uh, all of the South Asia there. And now he wants to head out west into Spain and that part of Europe. We saw last week that Paul was a pioneer missionary. We saw his ministry was to preach the gospel in places that had absolutely no gospel witness before him. And his strategy was to start churches in the major cities and then teach those churches to reach out into their surrounding areas and plant other churches and share the gospel that way. Paul has now covered the entire area, as I said, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. His plan now is to take an offering from uh, these churches that he has planted. He is collecting an offering as he travels from church to church. And he is taking this offering to the financial aid to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Once he uh, gets to Jerusalem and delivers the offering, his plan is then to visit Rome and then to go from Rome to Spain. Uh, And uh, he wants uh, his new missionary church base to be in Rome. Paul was a man with a heart for missions. He was a missionary. I believe he was the greatest missionary to ever walk this earth. Uh, You think about what he has accomplished in his life as far as planting churches and sharing the gospel without telephone, without email, without Facebook, without airplanes, without even a vehicle, and he was able to go across most of the known world in his lifetime and to share the gospel and plant churches. He had a heart not only to plant churches, but also to see those churches grow and flourish and reach out into their surrounding areas. And I believe that the Apostle Paul was overjoyed over the fact that these churches that he had personally planted and invested his life in are now taking up offerings of financial aid to help the original church, the first church back in Jerusalem. I believe he was overjoyed to be able to see the fruit of his ministry reaching back and coming full circle back to Jerusalem. As Paul continues to share his missionary heart with us in Romans chapter 15 with the church at Rome, and I want us to share some uh, principles that we as a church can implement into our missions program as we look at the missionary Paul and what he is discussing with this church in Rome. Some things that we as church can do, I believe, to demonstrate our love and our appreciation for our missionaries. We are supporting just right around 20 missionaries across the world. We have missionaries in Africa, missionaries in Asia, missionaries in Europe, South America. Uh, Here in Canada, we have missionaries in the Philippines, all over this world. And what can we as a church do to show our love and appreciation to our missionaries? Having been a missionary myself, growing up as a missionary kid, and then also serving with my wife for a term uh, on mission work, I know that we as a church can be doing a lot more than we are right now for missionaries. It's not just about writing a check. We could be doing so much more. And so I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Loving Our Missionaries. Loving our missionaries. Let's open our Bibles. Romans 15, beginning in verse 25. We'll go down to the end of the chapter. Romans 15, 25. The Bible says, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia 
to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed unto them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with, my, with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we come to you this morning. We open your word and we're asking the Holy Spirit of God to take the word of God and to bore it into our hearts, to make a change in our lives, to make a change in our approach to missions. Lord, we are doing the minimum and we can be and could be doing so much more if we would allow you and your spirit to create in our hearts a burden for missions, a burden for missionaries. And Lord, that if we would be intentional on how we demonstrate our love for missionaries. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, challenge us and change us as only you can. Be with the children and their lesson, and may you use them mightily. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one. Financially support missionaries. Financially support missionaries. Verses 25 through 27, he talks about how he's going to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And he has talked about the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, that they have taken a cert, a, um, an offering, made a certain contribution for the poor saints which are, are Jerusalem. But I want you to notice verse 27. It says, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Now these verses are speaking of a financial aid given to poor saints in Jerusalem, people who are already saved, but because of their great liberality in giving, as we saw early on in the book of Acts, how they, would, they didn't count these things to be themselves, but they would sell their lands and their, their homes, and they would sell everything they have, and they would put it in a big pile, set it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles would give to each person as it was needed. Well, they ran out of money, and they ran out of land, and now they are poor, and uh, now the Gentiles are taking up offerings to help them and to support them financially. But the argument in verse 27 Paul makes is that the Gentiles who were made partakers of the spiritual things that first belonged to these Jews are now debtors to help the Jews with material things. This same argument can be made about us as well. We are debtors because we have been made partakers of the gospel. We are debtors and we have... We, we have received this gospel freely. We are then debtors to others to get the gospel to them as well. We have received the gospel freely, and we are debtors to share the gospel with others as well. It is not right for you and I as, as people who have trusted Christ as our personal Savior to turn around and say, well, I got mine, you go get yours. I don't need to partake in, in sharing the gospel. I don't need to partake in giving to missions. I'm saved, and that's all that matters. That is not right. We are to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not something that we are to keep for ourselves. If you have received that great salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, who are you to stop it at yourself? Yeah. We are not to be wells soaking up the water. We are to be channels transferring the water to others. We are debtors. Notice what the Bible says again in Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Paul says, I am debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am reminded as I read these verses of another verse in Romans chapter 10, where it begins in verse 14, and it says, How shall they call upon him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear except there be a preacher that will preach unto them? And how shall they preach except they be sent? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But if we are selfish, and we're only thinking about ourselves and our salvation, and not about sharing the gospel with others, how will they hear? How will they have an opportunity to, share the, to hear the gospel, to receive Jesus Christ? If we're selfish, if we don't pass out tracts, if we don't make up John and Romans and get John and Romans out, if we don't send missionaries into foreign fields where we ourselves cannot go, how are they going to hear unless we get involved? We are debtors. Matthew chapter 28, this is our command by Jesus Christ. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We are to go. You say, well, I can't go to Africa. No, but missionaries can and we can support them. I can't go to China. No, but missionaries can and we can support them. I can't go to Brazil. No, but we have missionaries who are going to Brazil, and we can support them. Right. We can't all, but here, let me tell you something we can do. We can go across the street. Yeah. Come on. We can go down the street and down the, to the supermarket, and, and we can pass out tracks. How hard is it to pass out tracks? It's really not that hard. It's just as simple as taking one out of your pocket and saying, hey, I got something for you. Can you read this? It's not that hard, is it? And you, you say, well, what if they don't accept it? Well, it's on them then, isn't it? What if they do accept it? See, their blood is on our hands until we reach out and say, I got something for you. Once we've done our part, their blood is on their own hands. But we are debtors to share the gospel. We are debtors to send out missionaries we are debtors to our fellow man to take the gospel around the globe to every nation, every tribe, every tongue. We, can, we can't tell, we can't all go to foreign lands and preach the gospel. But we can stay here and preach the gospel. And we can send missionaries out to foreign lands and preach the gospel. I'm praying for uh, Brother Anders. He's in with the children right now teaching Sunday school. He is this close to making it to the Olympics next year, to be a, a speed skater in the Olympics, to represent Canada on the na international stage. But you know what else he's got a great opportunity to do if he gets there? Not only to represent Canada, but to represent Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's right. And wouldn't that be amazing if we would have more athletes? And I, there are several athletes. I've seen them this last few weeks when we had the Olympics in Tokyo, the Summer Olympics, and we had people from the United States who would stand up and they would say, Gold medals, they come and go. Records, they come and go. But Jesus Christ lasts forever. Yeah. And that's the kind of athletes we need. People like Brother Anders, and I hope he makes it to the Olympics, and I hope he wins a gold medal, and I hope when they interview him, he has an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with the world. Yeah. Right. We have an opportunity. We are debtors. We can financially support missionaries. David Livingston was a Scottish missionary, a pioneer missionary, and he spent his life exploring. Uh, he spent 33 years exploring and preaching the gospel in the heart of Africa. He endured much suffering as he labored to spread the gospel and open the continent of Africa to missionaries. He would literally create the trails to go deep into the Congo jungle and share the gospel. This godly missionary once said this, People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that really be called a sacrifice, which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay? It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger, now and then, with a foregoing of the common conveniences and the charities of this life, 
may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink, but let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in us and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made, who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. Here's a missionary who invested his entire life in missions in the continent of Africa, and he said, that was not a sacrifice, that was a privilege, that was my debt, that was part of something that I needed to do, a debt that I could never repay. It was a privilege. In 1792, William Carey preached his message, his famous sermon from Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3. And he summed up his teaching in these two important statements. He said, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. This led to the formation of the Baptist Missionary Society. And Carey, at the age of 33, proved his sincerity by volunteering to be its first messenger to the heathen, a pioneer missionary to India. Andrew Fuller had said this, There is a gold mine in India. But it seems as deep as the center of the earth. Who will venture to explore it? I will go down, responded William Carey, in words never to be forgotten. But remember, you must hold the rope. You must hold the rope. I will go down, but you have to hold the rope. Our debt as churches here in Canada is to hold the rope for the missionaries who will go out into the fields. Hold the rope to financially support them, to prayerfully support them. And as we'll see in our, in our message this morning, we can do more than just finances, but it w- at least, at the very least, we could financially support them. We have missionaries around the globe who are going down into the gold mines of the mission fields, searching for souls to win to the Lord Jesus Christ. And every, the very least that we can do is hold the ropes by financially supporting them. Number two, not only are we to hold the ropes by financially supporting our missionaries, but we are to refresh our missionaries. Refresh our missionaries. Notice verses 28 and 29. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Notice verse 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Paul was looking forward to the time when he would be able to be in in person with this church in Rome, with these Christians. He was looking forward to a time of mutual blessing. In fact, as we saw in previous verses, he was long wanting to go to Rome. And what hindered him to going to Rome was the missionary work that he was doing in other places. But he comes to the point where he says, I'm done the missionary work here. My pioneer missionary ministry in this area is done. I need to go farther west. And through, by coming west, I need to go through Rome. He was really looking forward to meeting the people of this church, many of whom we'll see in next week as we get into chapter 16. He knew them personally through his personal ministry. But verse 32 says that he wanted to be refreshed with them. He said he would come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ and be refreshed. Paul was not expecting to have a business deal with this church. Paul was not expecting to come to share his ministry, maybe give a PowerPoint and some pictures of what he's trying to accomplish, and then to say, could you guys support me financially and just make a business transaction? Paul was not trying or expecting to have some formal setting. It's just business kind of thing. Nothing personal. Just make a transaction here. I'll come by. You guys give me a big sum of money and I'll be on my way. That's not what Paul was looking for. No, he wanted to have a personal relationship with these church, with these people. That kind of blessing and refreshment that he's talking about only comes from relationships. And may I say to you this morning that if if all we're doing is sending checks to missionaries... All we've done is make a business transaction. We need to do something more than just business transactions. Something more than just 
writing a check and sending money to missionaries. We need to do more than that. We need to refresh our missionaries. How do we do that? By developing relationships with them. You see, when I was a kid growing up on the mission field, we didn't have Facebook. We didn't have instant messaging. It was only through, as we stayed in Romania for several years, that it came out with email and other things and computers and, and that kind of stuff. I, I remember, as long as I could remember, we were on, in the mission field. We sent, we sent letters back to churches. It was the worst part of our, of our ministry because they got me and my brother and sister to lick all the stamps. <laughs> we had to lick all the stamps. And we had, we had a lot of churches to send letters to, 40-some at least. And the reason being is many churches supported us for you know, $10 a month, $15 a month, $20 a month. Some had more, some less, as low as $5 a month. And so every church that supported us, no matter how much money they sent, we'd, we'd send them a quarterly newsletter. And so we had 40 to 50 some letters that we had to mail out every three months. When I became a missionary after graduating Bible school and uh, marrying my wife, all I had to do was send an email. It was so much easier. But you realize now, we have missionaries on the field. All you have to do is get onto Messenger of some sort, maybe WhatsApp or something like that, and send them a text, and you can instantly communicate with our missionaries. Instantly. They still have email, though. If you want to use email, they still have that. But you can do instant messenger. And, and how many of you have international messages, a text message on your phone for free? Anybody? Just me? You got international, free international messages on your phone. If you don't, you have to join, you have to join Kudo. <laughs> That's who gives it to you. But I can, send an, I can send a text anywhere in the world for free. Why not do that with our missionaries? See, this is another way that we as a church can love our missionaries, by having a relationship with them, by communicating with them, sharing burdens and blessings, sharing prayer requests and praises, by sending even small packages of things that aren't readily available on their mission field. You won't, you won't believe this, but many missionaries across this world do not have access to two-ply toilet paper. How many of you enjoy two-ply toilet paper? Anybody? Tree-ply. Tree-ply. <laughs> there you go. Luxurious. Not everybody has access to some things that, if they're from here, for example, uh, they're from here and they, they, they have these cravings every now and again for something that's just not available over there. When I, was a, when I was a kid growing up in Romania, every time I came back from Romania on furlough in Canada and the U.S., everywhere we went, all I drank was root beer because I knew for the next four years I'm not getting root beer. Craft dinner. Things that we say, oh, that's cheap, that's, we take it for granted. They would love to have some of the stuff we have here. How many of you Filipinos uh, were so excited when they finally opened up Jollibee? Anybody? Yeah? I mean, your, Leslie's son drove from, sons drove from Calgary to Edmonton to get Jollibee, and then they came right back. I know how much you guys love Jollibee, especially their sweet spaghetti, amen? Or the, that, what's that, peach and what, what kind of uh, pie is that? Peach and peach mango, yeah, those are my favorite. I'll go to Jollibee for, just for that, just for peach mango pies, Amen. But when, when you have access to it all the time, it's, and we take it for granted, but then they go into a mission field and now they have no access to it. Wouldn't it be great to get a little package or some things in there that they've been craving for months because they had no access to it? But we had a little bit of sense to send a little package or some things that they could enjoy. Relationships. Communication. Second Timothy 1.16 says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. He oft refreshed me. 
I wonder how many of our missionaries can say that about us, that we often refresh them, whether it was through relationships, through prayer, open communication, packages, other things of that sort. Many times our missionaries are the only ones in their country. They don't have that close friendship of another missionary in their area. Growing up in Romania, for the first several years, we were right there with a bunch of other missionaries. It was actually it was not for the first several years. It was for the later on. We were, we were in my dad's hometown, no missionaries in sight. And then we heard of other missionaries in other places, and we even moved closer, and that was, it was better for us for the relationship side of it. But then we moved back, and it's farther away again, and, you don't have, and we, would have, we would have every so often what we have missionary get-togethers, and we'd be all the missionaries in the country would come to a central area and come together for a day of fellowship and, and just hanging out and building those relationships. You see, we need community in church. We need friendships. We need relationships. And you, 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 would, you would think it was the same with missionaries. Now, they do have that community, and they do have the people that they're serving, but it's just not the same. You Filipinos know what I'm talking about. When you get together with other Filipinos, you, you're able to freely speak Tagalog together, and no, no white guy's going to come up and say, Hey, change the language. I can't understand you. And, and it's the same thing with us. I remember in Romania when I got to get, get together with some Americans, Canadians who spoke English, and we were able to talk together and we understood each other's language, and it was so much, it's, it, there's something special about that, amen? When you can get together with somebody of your own nationality, your own language, and just have that special friendship. We can fill the gap by being more involved in missionaries' lives especially now with Facebook, other instant communication. There's no excuse for us to not have a closer relationship with our missionaries. Paul eventually, after several years, was finally able to get to Rome, not as he had thought that he would, though. If you read the book of Acts, you know that he got to Rome in, in chains. He was refreshed by the church in Rome. We do not know even, to be honest, we don't know if he ever made it to Spain or not. The Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't tell us if he made it to Spain. But we do know that he was imprisoned twice. The first time at the end of the book of Acts when he was in Rome, he was released at that time. And I'm, I'm assuming that once he was released, he continued on with his plans to go to Spain and so on. And then later on in his life, he was re-imprisoned and that time beheaded for his faith. But churches were his lifeline. Churches refreshed him. Let's refresh one another. That's what church is about, coming together. It's not just about coming to a service and then going home real quick. It's about coming and talking and fellowshipping and maybe going out to meals together and having potlucks together and refreshing one another. Let's refresh one another. Let's refresh those in leadership Let's refresh our missionaries around the world. Let's make the ministry of refreshment part of our regular Christian lives. How do you do that? Through personal visits, communicating through available means, practicing hospitality. And if we do all of that with the gospel-saturated words of encouragement, we can refresh one another. Amen? It wasn't that long ago our church used to do something very unique and I thought it was very fun and I, I want to bring it back. Every month we would have a missionary of the month. And not only that, towards the end of the month we would have something that we would auction off to the church, usually a big, big canister of, of candies of some sort or nuts or whatever. We would have something, something really nice and we would auction it off to the highest bidder in the church, and all proceeds from that auction would go to the missionary of the month. How many of you would like to do that again, huh? Come on, Judith, raise your hand. Thank you. 
We we loved it. I think, Brother Kevin, you were in charge of that, weren't you? It was a lot of fun, picking out what we would auction off. And, and sometimes, even though the person who had the highest bid got that uh, item or whatever it was, sometimes they would share with others and others would also pitch in and, and pay a little bit more than just the highest, the highest bid. But I think we need to get back to doing more for our missionaries than just sending them a check, but being able to refresh them. And there's many ways we can do that. Re- we need to refresh our missionaries. Number three, we need to pray for our missionaries. Verse 30 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. If we truly love our missionaries... We will pray for them. Paul mentions the love of the Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ and for the love of the Spirit. In other words, the love that only the Holy Spirit can produce in us. Believers have a bond with one another through Spirit-produced love one for another. To pray for someone is to show them that you love them. Amen? If I say, brother, I'm going to pray for you, or sister, I'm going to pray for you, and I, and I follow through and I pray, I am demonstrating that I have a care for you, a love for you, that I am concerned about whatever it is that you're concerned about, that I want you to overcome that or whatever it is, I want that to be solved, that Jesus Christ would bring about that in your life. And for me to show empathy in prayer is to, to truly have a love for you. Genuine love will always drive us to our knees. If we love missionaries, we will pray for them. What is the one thing that missionaries try to get out every time they come to, to a church and they, they have a, sometimes they'll have a presentation, sometimes they'll have a table. What is, what is the number one thing that they're always handing out? What are they called? Prayer cards. Why are they called prayer cards? tell you why because they want every time you to see that card they want you to pray for them now a good church member and we have many prayer cards in the back table there a good church member is going to take a prayer card from every missionary that comes through whether we support them financially or not we'll take a prayer card and what i would like to see happen is that every single day you pull out a few prayer cards and you pray for them and you put them on the back of the list. And the next day, you pull out some more prayer cards. And you pray for them and put them at the back list. And just rotate through those prayer cards every single day. You don't have to pray for every single one every day. But at least two or three, pull them out and pray for them every single day. And I promise if you will pray for your missionaries, that just shows that you love them. If we love one another, we'll pray for one another. Amen? Right. Prayer is an expression of love. For the love of the Spirit. John Phillips comments and he says this, By praying for missionaries, a believer can place himself in a canoe on the Amazon, in an igloo in the Arctic, in a tent in the Sahara, in a submarine at the bottom of the ocean, in a plane high in the stratosphere. He can ward off from the missionary dangers in the jungle, diseases in the city slum, disasters on the deep. He can arm the missionary's witness with supernatural power, lift him from the slough of despond, rout the unseen foes that lurk in the spirit world, and strengthen his hand in God. By praying in the spirit, the exercised believer can conquer time and space and have a share in the missionary's battle. Let me tell you how you need to pray for your missionaries. Number one, we need to be praying passionately. Pray passionately. Notice in verse 30, he says this after the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That word strive together, that phrase, is one word in the Greek. It is the word sun agonizomai. Sun means together, agonizomai means to agonize. 
to strive in agony. So it literally means to agonize together with the missionary. What Paul is asking this church to do is agonize together with him in prayer. When was the last time you prayed with passion? Prayed with a deep burden? A deep passion in your soul, an agony, if you will. When was the last time the thought of someone dying and going to hell brought tears to your eye? When was the last time a missionary on a field who's struggling brought tears to your eyes? When was the last time that you prayed for someone and you were so burdened for their heart, for their soul, for their well-being, that you shed some tears? That it hurt inside. It not just emotionally, but physically hurt you inside. Strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Pray passionately. To strive with passion together in prayer for a missionary is our ultimate way to pray. To pray passionately, but notice secondly, pray intentionally. Make sure you are intentionally praying for our missionaries, on a daily basis. Paul mentions two dangers that he's asking for prayer in verse 31. A danger from without and a danger from within. He says, pray that God would deliver me from those that do not believe. We need to pray God would deliver our missionaries from those that do not believe. There are some people in some high, powerful places in foreign nations here in Canada that can really do damage to the people of God if they wanted to. Physical damage. But then there's also the danger from within. Pray that his ministry would be accepted of the saints. I'll tell you what. I know what it's like to be on a mission field, to go to a Wednesday night service, to show up you and your wife and have nobody show up for church. I know what that's like. Say, what do you do? Well, we have prayer meeting, wait a bit, and go home. Or if you want to practice your preaching and your wife wants to listen, go ahead and do that. I know what it's like to have a ministry that is not accepted by the saints. I also know what it's like to have a ministry that is fully accepted, where you come on a Saturday night, 7 o'clock, you come to the church building, and there's people outside running around playing. You go inside, and there's, you got a hundred people all together sitting there waiting to hear the gospel. A hundred people, children and, and teenagers that want to stay in church for an hour and just sing. And then they want you to preach for an hour. A small room with one heater and it's, everybody's in there and it's sweating and it's hot. And then after you preach for an hour, they want to give testimony for an hour. And then they want to play for an hour. They don't want you to go home. I know what it's like to have a ministry that is just you and your spouse and nobody really wants to come. And I know what it's like to have a ministry where everybody wants to come. And I know what it's like to have something in between. Pray intentionally for missionaries for two things. Protection from dangers from without and protection from dangers from within. It is very discouraging for anybody to come to church ready to preach and have no one show up. Not being received by those that are saints. It is very discouraging to have somebody in a position of authority in society who is out to get you and out to get your church, out to destroy what you're trying to build. You know, there are missionaries and churches and Christians in Afghanistan right now that really need our prayers. They're being persecuted. They're being murdered for their faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the Taliban is going door to door looking for Christians. We should be going door to door looking for the lost and trying to make them Christians. 
Here's the Taliban going door to door looking for Christians. And the, you say, well, what if they don't find Bibles? They'll take your phones and they'll check on your phones for Bible apps. And if they find out you're a Christian, they will persecute you. They will kill you. And we have governments like Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau who are standing by doing nothing. What we need to be praying for is these Christians to have strength. I heard, uh, read of a story of someone who had constant communication with, with a little house church in, in Afghanistan. And uh, they were sending messages through Facebook, through Instant Messenger, to be praying for us. The Taliban are coming to town soon. Uh, pray for us that God, would be, that God would keep us strong. Our children are, are making promises that they're not going to deny Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden... Communication stopped. And it is believed that everybody in that church was murdered. I have heard of horrendous things being done to Christians right now in Afghanistan. Pastors who the Taliban are saying, give us your daughter so we can marry her off to one of the soldiers. Your daughter is 15, 16 years old. What does a pastor do? Does he give him his daughter? Does he run, go into hiding and exile? What would you do? I'll tell you what I would do. I have no idea. But all we can do is pray. They need our prayers. There are Christians, missionaries that need our prayers. And that's just in Afghanistan. Think about the whole world. We need to be making an intentional matter of prayer to pray for our missionaries. Pray for them passionately. Pray for them intentionally. Pray for them specifically. Don't just pray generally. Lord, bless all the missionaries of all the world. Give them strength. Give them power. No, God wants you to pray specifically. That's why we have prayer cards. We have specific missionaries to pray for, specific prayer requests, specific needs that we need to be praying for. Pray specifically. Pray for their needs. Pray for their ministries. Pray for their gospel witness. Say, so how do I know about what their needs are? Well, you read their, their uh, newsletters. You communicate with them more intimately. If you had a closer relationship with our missionaries, we wouldn't need to worry about knowing or not knowing about their needs. We would know what they are. Communicating with them is how we know their needs. Pray passionately. Pray intentionally. Pray specifically. If they give you names to pray for, pray for those names. If they give you needs to pray for, pray for those needs. See, we need to love our missionaries, amen? They need our love, especially in these days when so many so-called free nations are becoming more and more communistic and restrictive. Let's make sure that we are faithfully supporting our missionaries financially, refreshing them through closer relationships and better communication and praying for them as we have promised to do when we took their prayer cards. Robert Arthington lived in a single room, cooked his own meals and shared his, friendships with, his friendship with students who were in need. Yet he gave tremendous amounts of money during his lifetime to Christian missions. When he died, his estate was worth about $5 million dollars which he willed to missions. After his death, a letter that he had received from a missionary was found in his belongings. It said this, Were I in England again, I would gladly live in one room, make the floor my bed, a box my chair, another my table, rather than the heathen should perish for the lack of knowledge of Jesus Christ. Robert Arthington was determined to make that kind of self-denial the pattern for his life. Now, I'm not saying sell your house, go into a one-room apartment, sell your furniture, and live out of boxes. But what I am saying is we could give up a coffee here and there. We could give up some time from our schedules and dedicate that to spending time communicating with our missionaries. We could be intentionally, passionately, specifically praying for our missionaries and specifically praying that their gospel witness would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that the heathen do not perish without the opportunity to know and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
Loving our missionaries is more about writing a check. It's about financially supporting them, building that relationship and refreshing them through good Christian fellowship, and praying for them. See, missionaries were willing to give up a lot of comfort to leave their home, their families, and to go out into a foreign world, learn a foreign language, a foreign culture, and to share Christ with those people. The least we could do is give up some comforts, give up some of our time so that we can refresh our missionaries have something to support them with financially, and pray for them. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. You're here this morning, you say, Pastor Vasi, God's spoken to my heart. I want to better demonstrate my love towards our missionaries. Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. We need to be loving our missionaries. We need to be doing more. I believe God has spoken to your heart. He's definitely spoken to my heart about this. Let's make it an intentional matter, something that we not just have good intentions, but actually follow through with it. Let's make an effort to get to know our missionaries better, make an effort to be refreshing to them, to pray for them, and make sure that we never go back on our commitments that we made to support them financially. God loves missionaries, and we need to love missionaries too, amen? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you for each and every missionary that we can support and those that we cannot. Lord, I pray that you'd help each and every one. Many of them have already had their services. Their Sunday is already over. Others, Lord, that are still having services. Lord, I pray that you'd bless their efforts, bless their church services, bless the congregations that are uh, attending there, Lord, that you'd bless their gospel witness. I pray, Lord, for us as uh, the church that we are, the small impact that we can have, I pray that you'd help us, help us to be committed to building our relationship with our missionaries, to praying for them specifically, intentionally, and passionately. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us the opportunity to support more missionaries, to see more families added to the roster, more nations, more languages, more ethnic groups. Lord, I know that that will not happen if we are not faithful in serving and loving the missionaries we have now. And I pray that you would do a work in our hearts as only you can. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.